what they do. That's what they do. So let's go over the map. So map activity is due today. Due today. What color did I tell you to highlight the central powers? What color? What color? Go ahead, Chris. Red. red. Okay, good. So I was hoping you did it in red. If you didn't, well, all right, whatever. I was hoping you did that. Ally powers in what? Go ahead, just blurt it out. Blue. Yep, good job. And I said the neutral countries in yellow. All right, so we're just going to kind of focus right here on the map. So let's start off with the central powers. Okay, so who's involved in central powers here? Who's involved? Go ahead, Connor. Germany. Yep, good job. I wish I could highlight it, but I can't. So Germany's right smack dab in the middle. We talked about them quite a bit already. All right, who else? What? Before I answer the question, I submitted it, and now my picture's not working. My map. Sounds like you problem. Yeah. Okay. All right, okay. So who else is involved in central powers? Chris. All right, go ahead, Paul. Austria-Hungary. Yeah, Austria-Hungary. Yep, good, good. So Austria-Hungary right here. Good, good. Who else? Who else? Go ahead, Parker. The Ottoman Empire. So the Ottoman Empire is right down here. Okay. Right down here. I know we talk about the Triple Alliance, the Triple Entente, but at this time, like I mentioned yesterday, with the Triple Alliance, who jumps out? Who jumps to the other side? Connor. Italy. Yep. Good job. So they jumped to the Allied powers, which, what's the reason? Why did I say they left? Paul. Yeah, the promised land. Good. Good. They're promised land. Well, in any case, that didn't really happen for them. So we'll mention that here soon enough. So there you go, you got your central power. So when you're looking at the map, why the Ottoman Empire? Why do you think Germany would want to ally with the Ottoman Empire? They're kind of old, they're outdated. Their military is not innovative like, let's say Germany or these other European countries. Why do you think they would want the Ottoman Empire? What's the reason for it? Why do you think? Connor, go ahead. Okay, yeah, resources, right? So as you're jutting over into the Middle East, that's important, especially when it comes to oil, right? So when it comes to fuel, why else? Why else? Good. They have access to big ships. Yeah, good job, right? Good job. So when you look at the Mediterranean flowing into the Black Sea here, right, it's important to note that Ottoman Empire has control of it. It juts over into this side as well so that they can prevent trade with who? Let's say the Allied powers wanted to uh, set up trade with this country right over here. Who's this? This big one. Parker? Russia. Yeah, good job. So you can cut off trade to them. So that's important to know. That's important to have. Okay. All right. So Allied Powers. Who's involved with the Allied Powers? The Triple Entente. We already talked about one of them, Russia, right? So who was Russia allied with? Go ahead, Paul. France. France. Yep, good job. So we got France right here. France. And who else? Who else? Main one. Go ahead, Parker. Great Britain. Good. So we talked about Great Britain already. Okay, we mentioned about them. All right. So... Where's Serbia at? Where's Serbia? Where's Serbia? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, just south of, yep, just south of Austria-Hungary, right down here. Okay, so we already talked about Bosnia, right? Sarajevo, where Franz Ferdinand was uh, parading around, which is right over in here. Okay, and Serbia, knowing that they're probably next if they don't do something about it, right? Uh, that's going to carry over this imperialistic nature to, you know, maybe capture their land. So that's where Serbia is at. Okay. All right. So we already mentioned Italy. Italy's right here. Allied powers. They'll move to the allied powers here soon enough. Okay. Okay. So those are the main countries that I was talking about yesterday when it came to the alliance systems, when we mentioned about the central powers, the allied powers. Okay. Yeah. Serbia's involved. Obviously, they're the one who kind of kickstarts it. And Russia gets involved because it's their bigger brother. They're the protector of the Slavic speaking people. All right. All right, so bodies of water here. Bodies of water. All right, real quick, though, Belgium, we already mentioned them with the, right, Schlieffen plan, how Germany marches right through Belgium, okay, to capture Paris and try to swing down and capture the forces there at the Maginot Line. But it is halted, which we'll talk more about today. All right, so what about the bodies of water here? So all the way over here, what do we have? Spreads all the way over to the United States. Go ahead, Wyatt. The Atlantic. the Atlantic Ocean. Yep, good job. All right, so why is this important here? What's this body of water that goes right between Great Britain and France? What's that body of water here? Paul? The English Channel. Yep, good job. Good job, the English Channel. So that's important to note, especially when we're talking about the Schlieffen Plan 
where I mentioned about Great Britain getting involved in this war and how the Schlieffen plan was trying to really, really uh, try to build, build up forces for Germany along the coast to prevent Great Britain from entering. If they could do that, then this war is going to be pretty quick on the Western Front. All right, where else? Where else do we have here? Go ahead, Wyatt. What's up here? What's up here? The North Sea. Yep, good job. So you got the North Sea. Okay, so that's important to know, especially when we're talking about that German and uh, Anglo naval arms race and how they're kind of duking it out for supremacy before the war, building up to it. All right, what about over here? What about over here? Why go ahead? Baltic. The Baltic Sea. Yep, good job. So that's important as well when you think about Germany, when you think about Russia and their naval fleets. Okay, good, good. All right, down here, right where Italy's at here, jutting down into Africa. Go ahead, Parker. Yep, the Mediterranean Sea. Good job, the Mediterranean Sea. So, again, that's important when it comes to resources, materials coming from Africa as you're imperializing these lands and really helping out, benefiting the central powers there from the beginning of war. But, obviously, that's a means of control for both powers. They want to make sure they can shut out the other one by cutting off its supplies. All right, uh, I don't know if this one was labeled, but what was this? I talked about it already. Go ahead, Chris. The Black Sea. Yeah, good job. So in today's world here with Russia, Ukraine, they talk quite a bit about the Black Sea. All right. And uh, obviously, that's kind of where Ukraine's focus and we're with Russia. Obviously, that's important to know. OK, OK. So those are the bodies of water. I really want you to know those are the countries I really want you to know, especially a part of what we mentioned with the allied powers and the central powers. OK, OK. So let's go down here to the questions. Number one, why would Germany worry about the alliance between France and Russia? Go ahead, Parker. It would force their hand to, to fight. Yeah, good job. So from the very beginning, France realized if Germany's going to attack them, they need to they need to have some backup, right? And at the time, they weren't just real clear friends with Great Britain yet. Okay, again, their rivalry dating back for hundreds of years, literally cause them to be bitter rivals. But with France, they realize that if Germany's going to attack them, they need to have some sort of friendship here. And why not Russia? They are right on the other side of each other, and Germany's smack dab right in the middle. So if Germany's going to fight this war, they're going to have to split up their troops and forces. Okay, hence the plan we already talked about. Oh, Anna, what was that plan again, where Germany wants a plan to attack France before Russia gets involved? The Schlieffen plan. Yep, good job. Good job. All right, so make sure you Answered that for number one. Okay, again, we talked about that. Should have been review. Two, based on looking at your map, what side seems to have the advantage based on the alliance system? Connor, go ahead. Uh, the allied powers relatively surround central powers. Yeah, good job, right? So when you think about just who's all involved, right, the allied powers, there's a lot more of them. And we didn't even mention the United States. They'll be joining here soon enough. Japan is also going to join. So when you think about just numbers, population, right, that's huge to know. And uh, when you think about just location, the Allied powers surround the central powers. So cutting off supplies and materials coming in and out of their empires, even from their territories overseas. So, yeah, when you can look at the map there, you can indicate that, you know what, probably the Allied powers have the clear advantage. Okay. All right. So make sure you have that assignment turned in. I'll have that graded. And when is... Your quiz, Paul, tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, good, tomorrow. So it's going to be on the iPad, so have that ready to go. All right, so if you haven't done so, I had the site unblocked here. I had to reach out to IT, but anyway, we got the site unblocked, which is nice. Anybody play it yet? No. Yeah, so the, uh, the goal here is to try to get 100% fastest time. All right, so let's just do it real quick. Romania, where are they? Right, right here? Yeah. Good. Ottoman Empire. Belgium. We already talked about that with the Schlieffen plan. Serbia. Great Britain. Austria Hungary. France. Italy. Germany. Bulgaria. Portugal. Denmark. Greece. Norway. Which one? The one on the left. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, good. Netherlands. Switzerland. Russia. Sweden, Spain. Oh, 100%. Oh, Luxembourg isn't on that map. I know. I heard you guys complain about that. Yeah, Luxembourg's not up there. Oh, darn. Darn. All right. So, anyway, you guys get 100%.
okay, fastest time, screenshot it. Don't be sharing with anybody. Oh, I did this night. But make sure you guys are truthful with it here. And whoever wins gets an extra credit point. Got it? Okay, here is your bell ringer for today, since we've been talking about it quite a bit already. So describe Germany's attack on France at the start of World War I. What was this invasion called? What were the goals of this plan, invasion? And it'll work. It'll work. There you go. All right, so the quiz won't take you too long to complete. Um, I will check your bell ringers tomorrow. We will have one tomorrow. I'll talk about trend warfare today. And then, uh, yeah, so quick review about trench warfare on the quiz. I'll wrap things up. Sound good? Some reason we do that right away. Fine, just check my quiz. Sound good? Game does work though, right? There's the triad button. Okay, good. 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 Not too much after hours, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
All right, okay. All right, so what was the invasion name again? Alana said it already a couple times. What was the invasion's name? The Schlieffen Plan. Yep, good job. So you got the Schlieffen Plan. Good, good, good. So Germany was planning this attack for a long time, even before the war started. So in the early 1900s, Germany was already plotting this invasion. And the reason for it is because of what alliance that France had. Who were they allied with? Who were they, allied with? Who were they uh, friends with here? Go ahead, Chris. Russia, yep, good job. So they realized if this war was going to start, it's going to be a two-front war. All right, so Russia, were they mobilized just yet? Do they do you think they were industrialized and made a bunch of other Western European countries? Not really, not really. When you're comparing Russia to Germany, to France, to Great Britain, they're falling behind. They're the laughing stock of Europe. Okay, they just lost a war to Japan. So in all reality, right, a lot of these German officials thought we can just take care of France real quick and focus all of our attention on Russia. Because they're not industrialized yet, they don't have the means of transportation like railroad systems connecting all throughout the country like these other European countries. So Germany thought, well, we'll take care of France quick, like we did in the Franco-Prussian War. And we'll use this plan to try to attack through Belgium, right? To, uh, to uh, march right through this country, this neutral country, to get a little closer to Paris, right? So if they can capture this capital city, chances are this is going to be the end of the war in the Western Front. What are all, what are their goals, though? What did we talk about yesterday? Why else do you think they want to stay up so close to the coastline here? Paul, oh, they want to stop Great Britain. Yeah, good job, right? So they realized, right, if uh, Great Britain would get involved in the Western Front, this would halt their advance. This would stop them literally in their tracks. Okay, so Germany realized that they need to make sure they can keep Great Britain out of this conflict. That's why a lot of the troops are marching up real close to the coastline, trying to prevent Great Britain from landing troops down in Europe. Okay, if that happened, well, that would establish the planet's tracks, which didn't happen, right? It didn't happen. So the goal was to capture Paris, swing like a door, right? Swinging door, and capture a lot of the troops down here, right, at the Vatican Line, which is right between Germany and France. Okay. So they're gonna act like a swinging door and trap all the troops there quick and easy, and then they can send all their troops over to Russia and duke it out with them. All right, is there any questions on this plan? Did it work out? Was it successful? Paul? Oh, no. no. Why not? Because, well, going into this, Russia mobilized a lot faster than they did. Yeah, good. Russia mobilized a lot quicker, and uh, they didn't expect Great Britain to get their troops on the ground. And at the same time, we talked about it last chapter a little bit, but the telegraph system, communication, who controlled these means of communication? Parker, Great Britain, right? So all those, all that means of communication had to go through Great Britain first, right? So they kind of had a heads up of this plan even before it was about ready to start. So it was one of those things with the means of communication, the means of technology, obviously that's gonna be a huge asset for the Allied powers. Yeah, so Germany will then have to what? Disguise their codes, disguise their communication, being sent back and forth. Man, it must be nice to control the communications, right? Especially consider. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to that here soon enough. Okay, here's your term for today. Just one. One term. Trench warfare. All right, there you go. Trench warfare. Bless you. Bless you.
All right, so trench warfare. This is the style of warfare that's going to really consume World War I, Europe, okay? And this is going to put over 400 miles of trenches all throughout Europe. Okay. Even still this day, you can see some of the impacts, the environmental impacts of World War One in Europe, even after World War II happened. The reason for it is because with this style of warfare, with trench warfare, you can see these trenches dug out all throughout northern France, even Belgium, all the way down, pretty much connecting the English Channel all the way down to the Alps. Right? So that's a long ways, isn't it? A long ways. And it just shows you know, again, really how brutal this war was. So you guys know a little bit about trench warfare. What do you know about it? What do you know about it? What about the effects of it? What do these soldiers have to do in the war? What, Barbara? Yeah, right? It was disgusting, right? It was always wet. There's constantly puddles within the trenches. There's no drain drainage there at all. A lot of these troops have stood in puddles of water for long periods of time. What happens if you just kind of stand in this water for a long period of time? What happens if you bleed or it gets stuck in your arms? Yeah, you get trench foot, right? It starts to prune up, starts to kind of uh, get irritated, and it will eventually, I don't know, maybe just kind of get to the point where it gets so numb that you can't really find use of it anymore. And then, I don't know, because of the stench, because of the dead bodies that piled up all throughout the trenches during World War One, because it's not like you just get these bodies and throw them out of the trench. Do that, chances are you find a bullet from anyone, right? So they just left the bodies in the trenches. Gross, right? Disgusting. So there are bodies laying right beside you. You just have to deal with it. You just have to deal with it. So that would attract what? What do you think we got attracted by? The stench of the dead bodies just rotting away. Awesome. Rats. rats. Yeah, good, good. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you'd wake up just with a rat gnawing off your feet, gnawing off your limbs, which a lot of times actually happens. More people die just with the effects of sheer boredom, of just the, the effects of the trenches, but into just a poor layout of them, constant rain and constant water out in the trenches, and just lack of food, than actual battle. Right? That's the truth. So with trench warfare, it was brutal. Okay, a lot of times, too, you're just waiting for your opposition. This was a bloody stalemate. They're just waiting for the opposition to maybe march across no man's land to attack. So this was brutal. It was terrible. Okay. Like I said, no man's land, that's that area, that center, the part in the middle of the trenches. Okay. So you have one trench. They do them in zigzag. They dig them in zigzag. Why do you think they dig them? They dug them in zigzag. What's the reason for it? And here's the opposition. How would they dig their trench? Paul. Oh. if an enemy got to the can just start shooting down. Yeah. Yeah, good. So with the new forms of weaponry that were involved in World War One, you have machine guns now. They have rapid fire uh, weapons and uh, trench guns. Okay. So if they got in, let's say a trench and it was a straight line, you could probably mow everybody down in one burst, really. Okay. So it was one of those things, that's why they broke up the trenches. They wanted to make sure that they had some sort of uh, breakage in the trench so that they just couldn't mow everybody down all at once. So yeah. Oh gosh, can you imagine? And the way they try to get, let's say, a way around, or maybe try to uh, try to get the advantage of another trench, is that they would literally just try to dig closer and closer to these trenches so that they could maybe dig around them. But obviously, they could just continue on. That's why, like I said, these trenches were literally dug to the English Channel all the way down to the Alps, 400 miles, right? And these impacts are still there within Europe. You can still see some of the trenches that were dug out during World War One. Okay, so like I said, what's in the center? What's in the center? No man would want to go in this. Oh, oh man. Okay, Austin. No man. I can't be out. So you got no man. Good. A lot of times too, they have barbed wire right in front of the trenches. Literally, literally right all throughout the trenches. The reason for it is because, let's say, if some troops and soldiers are sprinting across, you don't try to hold them up. You don't try to prevent them from getting into your trench. But what better way than just trying to have, let's say, an obstacle on the wire? That would catch them, really jack them up, and then you can easily pick them off before they jump in your trench. Also, they'd have artillery, right? So you have your artillery right behind each trench, and you even have it on this side. And they'd launch, literally. 
over to no man's land trying to prevent any type of troops from running across and taking him prisoner. So no man's land, you would never want to get caught there because there's constant firing, constant shelling of this land to make sure and prevent there's no invasion coming across. Obviously you have your snipers here, you have your machine gun nets, right? You got your pretty much your uh, other forms of smaller artillery focus in the trenches to try to prevent any type of troops from coming across. Also, we'll mention chemical warfare. So in chemical warfare, you'll get chlorine gas, you'll get mustard gas, and that's another way to try to prevent other troops, the opposition, from marching across. Right? If their lungs are filling up with fluid, well, chances are they're not going to make that trek, they're not going to make that run across no man's land. And uh, that's another deter away from any type of invasion. That's why this was such a stalemate for so long. So long, these countries, and that's obviously the Central Powers of Germany, pretty much, first France and Great Britain, they were just waiting, waiting for the opposition to run across. They pretty much went suicide in a way as they're taking the trek. So, yeah, trench warfare was brutal. Yeah, it was very brutal. Like I mentioned, with the effects of trench warfare, uh, because there's not much drainage, it's not like there's electricity, there's not like there's running water. In some of the trenches there were, but not all of them. Because many of the countries realize that they're not going to be there for a long time. Germany actually, at the start of the war, started to do that. Hey, let's just try to make this somewhat of a livable situation, because we're going to be here for a long time. France and Great Britain, not so much. They're just kind of digging out trenches, thinking, well, we'll be here maybe for a day, and then we're going to move on. And that didn't happen, obviously. So there you are, enduring the elements, rain, right, snow, for long periods of time, and you're just going to feel the effects of that sooner or later. Again, a lot of the troops just died from real shell shock and just the effects of boredom. Right? A lot of these troops and soldiers lost their mind, waiting and knowing that they're going to die sooner or later. And sooner or later, they might get caught in the crossfire. Or they'll get the alert from their command and they're going to have to march across no man's land, knowing there's no way out. All right, we'll talk about other elements of warfare, other weaponry like airplanes, and how that's going to be introduced on the battlefield, zeppelins, okay, and how that's kind of useful. But in many cases, it's just a bigger target. All right, here's another look at these, uh, these trenches. Okay, like I said, no man's land right in the middle. Yeah, you have the enemy on the other side. You have barbed wire there littered right in front of your trench to try to prevent any type of invasion. They'll get stuffed up in the barbed wire. Easy thinking is to just stick them off, shoot them as they're stuck in the barbed wire trying to get through it. Okay, like I said, here are the trenches in zigzags, right, so that their enemy doesn't just pop in and mow everybody down in one burst. Okay, back in the back here, you might have some resting areas, okay, but for the most part, you're stuck in the front, front of the trench. Okay, you are waiting for the opposition to make that track, to make that invasion over to your trench, right? So, in some cases, you'd have shifts, right? You'd have shifts back and forth where some of the troops would, you know, have time to sleep, have time to rest, have time to eat. And then focus here in the back, let's say number three here. Number three, you have your command posts where they maybe plan out and receive signaling messages from a general of different types of strategies that maybe a plan attack might occur, might happen. And like I mentioned, you have your artillery right behind you. So the artillery is literally shooting up over your head the whole time, right? So during the time, obviously, and even still today, it's pretty loud. So a lot of these soldiers suffered from shell shock. Can you really sleep if there's constant artillery fire over the top of your head? No. No. Right? A lot of these soldiers were just psychologically impacted by this war, by sitting in the trenches for years on end. Literally, for four years, this war went on and waged on. And uh, with that artillery lofted off over your head, chances are you'll see eventually death. Again, with the dead bodies, not like you can just throw the dead bodies out of the, the uh, trench because you are susceptible to them fire. So you just let them lay. Some of them actually kind of pile them up on the top, use it as cover, right? So they're your friend, one friend, right? There you are using them as somewhat as a meat shield to protect yourself. Gross, smelly, disgusting. And there were some cases, I won't say a lot, some cases of cannibalism because lack of food. There's no way to try to keep your food and any type of resources safe uh, and preserved during these times of the trenches for long years. Terrible stuff. Like I said, rats, 
people get attracted by the stench of the dead bodies. Okay, here's just another look of some trenches. And there were some cases where you'd wake up and the rat would just be gnawing off your feet. Your feet would be numb because you'd be constantly submerged in water. To try to prevent that, they actually had someone that put her in the trenches. Okay, and they had a footer here so that you could kind of stand up on, and at the same time, you can use as you know, a way to stick your rifle out and shoot the opposition coming across no man's land. But you all know the water is going to go to the low surface, and it's not like they had a lot of drainage there in these trenches. So a lot of them just kind of stood up on top of these planks to try to prevent any type of trench foot. Okay, so there was a lot of propaganda pieces out there. I won't say propaganda, but just kind of informative. Uh, sheets to keep making sure that uh, your feet were protected and uh, different types of uh, different types of articles and writing and posters and saying that, you know, a trench foot is a big deal. And if you don't take care of it, if you don't sanitize your feet, clean your feet, keep them dry, well, you're going to see the harsh effects of it. OK, so we just talked about this. OK, we just mentioned about this. And sometimes, which is very rarely. They actually had ceasefires at night, obviously, in the dark. It's kind of hard to see your opposition. And they'd actually bring some of the soldiers from Germany, from, let's say, France, Great Britain, America. They'd come in the middle, play some cards a little bit. And then once daylight was coming around, they'd just jump back in the trenches and get after it. Pretty crazy, isn't it? Pretty crazy. Crazy stuff. There's actually stories of that, especially during Christmas. Time. Oh, last thing here. Lord of the Rings. You guys like Lord of the Rings, right? Oh, here's a picture of trench foot. Oh, keep your feet dry. Keep them clean. You could get trench foot. Oh, gross. Disgusting. You guys like Lord of the Rings in here? Tolkien, the author. Okay. A lot of the imagery and a lot of the stories he talked about in his books actually came from World War I. And uh, a lot of the imagery left uh, with flamethrowers, with airplanes, artillery, the death that was uh, constantly going around him were signs, were examples for him in his books. So that's something. That's something. You guys get to see. So that movie is pretty good, Tolkien, right? Talks a little bit about his time in World War One. All right, okay. Is there any questions? We'll talk about weapons of warfare next time. Any questions? All right, hey, we actually have three minutes here. You know what that means? Alana, you know what that means? Another assignment. Oh, just joking, just joking. All right, hey, study for your quiz. Study for your quiz. I'm saying